This is my conflict of interest. Uh, and we already discussed this uh, paper. Huh? It was a little bit surprising that we, in the early phase of ARDS, maybe it makes sense to give muscle relaxants to our patients. And we did it 20 years ago, but we learned from the combination of muscle relaxants, uh, norepinephrine, and also steroids is not a real good combination for our patients. But what we have seen by giving the first two days uh, full paralyzation, you see that you are shorter on mechanical ventilation. And, and what we already discussed in the first talk from this session is that it is a better synchrony. And maybe and this is especially important in patients who have a high respiratory drive. And so they like to have a minute ventilation in the acute phase and they are maybe have fever, <coughs> they are producing a lot of CO2 and maybe they have, would like to have a minute ventilation of around 15 liters, 70 liters and by changing your, of optimiz optimizing your ventilator you only reach 12 liters or something like that. And then of course the patient needs more and then they is fighting um, against the ventilator and then it makes sense. Um, to give uh, full muscle relaxant. And, and, and when your patient is in stress and then he still has enough uh, activity of his diaphragm, he is not exhausted, exhausted at that time, then he can really generate very negative pleural pressure. And this is visualized here in this cartoon. And if, for example, when the patient is a non-invasive ventilation, with a pressure support of 10 centimeters of water, but maybe when he is really can contract his diaphragm, he can generate a pleural pressure of minus 50. And when you then calculate the transpulmonary pressure for the lung, it's 10 minus minus 15, and then the transpulmonary pressure is 25, and that is in the dangerous um, uh, level. And we, we, uh, we of C do uh, also this in Rotterdam. And we have most of the time we are using the pressure support ventilation, and we are infected by the virus of the open lung cancer with Bruner Lachman in Rotterdam. So we are used to use high uh, peak levels. But when you see here in this patient during the expiration, his esophageal pressure was 20. 3.6 in the expiration, but during inspiration it's uh, minus 2.3. And when you then calculate the transpulmonary pressure for the expiration, it's 20 minus 23.6, it's minus 3.6. But for the end of inspiration, uh, when he is ventilated only with a low driving pressure, then it's 31 minus minus 2.3, and then you have a high transpulmonary pressure. So this patient has a lot of stress. <laughs> when you switch over uh, by deeper sedation, maybe also muscle relaxation, and you switch over from pressure support ventilation to pressure control ventilation, almost with the same settings, you see that the, ins the driving pressure at the end of inspiration is lowered to 11.4. So maybe it's, it's this is uh, much better for your patients. Um, we are also looking with the EIT, that's electrical impedance tomography. Uh, it's a belt around the thorax, more or less an ECG, electrodes around the thorax, and you can visualize the ventilation in your patient, and especially the difference between the ventral part and the dorsal part and the region where you are measuring. And here we did this in uh, uh, post-cardiac surgery patients, uh, just more or less normal lungs after cardiac surgery. And we looked at the difference between controlled ventilation and later on we switched within the patients to pressure support ventilation. And here you see the difference between the non-dependent and the dependent part. Uh, for controlled ventilation with low tidal volumes, then you see that there is an even distribution between the ventral and dorsal part. However, when you uh, see when the ventilation is with higher tidal volumes, you see that more ventilation is going to the ventral part and the non-dependent part. When you switch over to pressure support ventilation with low tidal volume, and then there is more effort of the diaphragm, and it is a bigger displacement on the dorsal side. You see that there is more volume, more uh, air going to the dorsal part in comparison with the ventral part. And when you have 
higher tidal volume, then it's even better distribution, but you can see at the end, maybe this ventilation is too long, and something to do with the delayed uh, triggering. And this was also already shown by the group of Amato and the papers of Yoshida, uh, where they looked in this in, in uh, uh, rabbits, where they, in normal lungs, um, then, then they see, um, for example, volume control ventilation, and again they look for the ventral and dorsal uh, ventilation distribution, that there is no difference between spontaneous breathing and muscle parabolasis when you have healthy lungs. However, in an injured lung model, you see the opposite. Eh? You see that during spontaneous breathing, most of the ventilation is going to the dorsal side. However, when you give muscle paralysis, uh, then you see that most of the start of volume is going to the ventral part when you use, in this animals, HML per kilogram body weight. And this we already discussed. Um, also, when you look to a patient who is on uh, pressure control ventilation with the pendle luft, that you see difference in ventral and dorsal ventilation. Um, and especially also when you see muscle paralysis, that also here there is difference um, in ventilation distribution between the ventral and dorsal part. And then we, uh, we read a, a very nice article by the group of Leo Holmes from Nijmegen, at the eastern part of um, uh, uh, the Netherlands, where they had um, uh, studied in a small group of patients, 10 patients with lung injury, but they, these patients were still under sedation, but had tidal volumes during the pressure support ventilation with more than 8 ml per kilogram body weight. And then they tried to study the effect of uh, higher pressure support, lower pressure support, 12 versus uh, 6, and also the combination um, with um, NAVA. And then in the second part of the study, they titrated boli of rotoronium to have uh, to lower the tidal volume to a target of 6 ml per kilogram body weight. And then in the third phase of their study, they give this for during in, um, continuous infusion of this uh, rotoronium for one hour during NAVA and pressure support. And here you see the results. Eh? During uh, the pressure to support 12, you see here the tidal volume. The tidal volume is high. When you lower the pressure support, you see a decrease. And with the NAVA, it's even higher. And then they titrated um, this um, boli of rotoronium, and they were able to reduce um, the tidal volume uh, to almost 6 within a couple of minutes. And then they have to give different doses of rotoronium to the different uh, patients. And here you see the effect of the driving trans the transpulmonary uh, pulmonary driving pressure. And when you lower the tidal volume with this partial uh, with this boli rotoron, you see that the driving pressure is lower and also uh, the electrical activity uh, at the, um, with the NAVA catheter is decreased. And when you continue with this and that by continuous uh, infusion the, the tidal volume stays stable during the pressure support ventilation and also during NAVA ventilation. So what we did is we tried it also in our patients. We had a patient what was, was transferred to us because we are an ECMO center and this patient had severe ARDS due to influenza um, and he was already uh, in prone position um, uh, with 100% exogen and we should put him on, on, on uh, ECMO. Um, now, first we had the patient was of a high uh, uh, peak level and based on the transpulmonary pressure we brought in an esophageal balloon, we further increased, had our uh, space to further increase the peak uh, pressure and we continued with low driving pressure and we continued mechanical ventilation. But with this patient it was very difficult that after one week to stop um, and to lower uh, and to switch over from control ventilation to support ventilation. When we did it all the time, he was uncomfortable, uh, had high tidal volumes. So um, at day 18, um, we, we changed to, uh, um, to uh, change the sedation level, um, but then still on day 20, he had a high drive with high uh, pressure support. And here you can see the different uh, effects during inspiration. This is the pressure measured not um, in the tracheal, uh, at the end of the tube, and this, the tracheal pressure 
here the esophagus pressure, and here you can see the volume, how this patient is breathing uh, uh, during uh, uh, pressure support ventilation. And you see here in the esophagus pressure, in the expiration, it's around 20, but during an inspiration, he is lowering um, to minus 10, and here you see also the effect um, in the trachea. So the, the, the transpulmonary pressure is not that high uh, for this patient, but you're not comfortable that this tidal volume is so, so high after 20 days of mechanical ventilation. So what we did is we did more or less the same as the people in Nijmegen. We started with boli um, um, of roturonium. Uh, after one hour, we have the, uh, gave this patient almost 50 milligrams of roturonium. Then the tidal volume decreased and we started an infusion pump to the next day and after the next day we stopped the infusion pump and then this patient was still breathing with a tidal volume of around 6 ml per kilogram body weight and then we were able uh, to very lower the days after that uh, lower the sedation and, and, and we switched over to uh, uh, lower the ventilatory support and then after four days we were able to extubate this patient and here you see the effect. And when we gave this uh, roturonium, then the effect on the uh, esophageal pressure was lower, the transpulmonary pressure was lower, and the, 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 the as seen here, but especially you see that the tidal volume was now around 6 ml per kilogram body weight. So maybe you can use partial uh, muscle relaxant, but um, uh, also a very nice, very nice uh, proposal was done by also the group of Marcella Amato, and he studied maybe to give more uh, and then the effect on uh, the respiratory drive. And he did that in rabbits and in pigs. And here you see when during uh, this lung injury model, you see uh, when you use uh, low beep, seven to eight, you see that the driving, the esophageal pressure is, is going down. That means there's more and more effort. And you can partially counterbalance that by applying higher beep, and you see the same effect is in pigs. And also, um, they made a PET scan of this uh, procedure here in this uh, pig animal, and you see when you use this high beep levels, you see less uh, inflammation as you see here with the lower beep. So maybe when you give more beep, the, the diaphragm is more flattened, um, and you see less uh, a real uh, active contraction of this diaphragm. And they also did it in one patient. So they increased uh, the creep from 5 to 15 centimeters of water. Mm. And you can see here. And here you see the effect on the negative esophageal pressure. Here it was minus uh, 3. And now it was um, uh, uh, improved to plus 2 only after increasing the peak level. So my conclusion is limitation of tidal volume and transpulmonary pressures can be reached by lowering a level of spontaneous effort uh, by partial neuromuscular blocking agent or by increasing PEEP. Thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>